Okay, hello, 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 and we are here. Um, alternative, and this time we're doing it with Mr. Roslan Sirota. Hey, what's up, man? It's good to be here. And uh, <laughs> you applause, you applause. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, you are visiting here yeah. in Tel Aviv. You live in LA, I do. Like you grew up in Israel, though. I sure did. And you grew up in Ukraine. Uh, sure as all hell did, yeah. So Absolutely. let's start with the Ukraine for a right. second, because it's Ukraine very it's hot Ukraine. right now. Yeah. It's hot. It's pretty hot. Literally uh, hot. It's awful. I'm super heartbroken watching all this crazy shit. And uh, I, I really, I don't really know what to say. Like the No, but your, your but memories, my, like oh when my, you grew up well, there. Yeah. Oh, well, dude, back then, it wasn't really Ukraine. It was Soviet Union. Ukraine okay. was like a Massachusetts, like a state. Okay. It's not. The country was the Soviet Union. So, so for me, we, you know, it, it was, it was just like, I had nothing to compare it to. It was the way it was. Uh, life wasn't all that great. And we lived like, what, four hours away from the nuclear reactor also. So that wasn't good. Uh, it was just the childhood, only in respect later when I moved and I lived here and I lived in the States, I realized how crazy it was. Like I'd have to, like I remember having, like I would go in the morning or whatever and, and like get bread for mom, like wait in line to get bread. And we'd have to go a certain hour because after a certain hour there was, you know, run, ran out of bread and like then you have to not have it and go to more. It was crazy shit like this. It was like Soviet Union type you know, life, but, but it was normal. It wasn't like anything extraordinary. Yeah, you got to, you got to go and get the bread. That's right. You just, that's right. And some people, you know, who live in, in, in some other countries got to go walk a mile to get the water. water exactly. From the well. And it's not for them. It's absolutely normal. And we'd have hot water like once a week on a Friday. Really? Oh, yeah. So how do you do it like do it throughout the week in the winter? You, how do you? You, you, you boil water. You boil water and then yeah. you bathe in boil and water. And then I, I'd go first and then my older cousin would, would go second in the water that I bathed in and that's that. And the, But that was just normal. It's normal. Just, absolutely. I mean, it's insane now. I, I live in LA. My building didn't have hot water for like one afternoon, I think a month ago. And I almost lost my shit. I was like, <laughs> what? What the fuck? I almost started singing the, the Soviet <laughs> anthem again. I was like, God... And, so, and then it happened again the other week, and it really made me like, God, we used to just not have hot water. And yeah. That was just, that's the deal. There isn't any. Sorry. That's it. It's actually more healthy. Right. To have, you know, if you bathe in cold water. That's right. Your immune oh, well, that explains like everything. Yeah. That's, right. well, that's why we're strong people. We yeah. had to, to wash in cold water. So do you right. still have some people that you know over there, relatives My parents mostly, yeah. Distant relatives and a bunch of my parents' friends. My parents immigrated when they were in their 30s. And so obviously they have a bunch of you know classmates and, and 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 coworkers from back in that life. When you leave a place in your 30s, by then you already know a bunch of people there. At. So my parents, have, I don't not so much myself. A couple of people that you know that I went to first three grades with that I spent you know I only went to the first three you know grade one, two, and three over in Soviet Union. So I'm, I'm still in touch on Facebook with some of those kids, but I haven't seen them in, you know, in an increasing, increasingly longer and longer period of time at this point. And it's, it's been, they all have kids now and like, they don't even look, you know. Last time we saw each other when we were eight or something. Now okay. we're in our 40s. Okay. So like, we're not like friends, friends, but I'm in touch with a few of them. And, and, and some people I met on tour when I was touring Ukraine, uh, actually, some journalists so, and it's horrible. And it's, it's horrible. It's, it's crazy. Horrible. And they're in hiding. They're like running away. It's it's, lit it's war. It's just it's it's like good old old school 
military you know invasion and takeover it's like that it's like old school we come with tanks and we, we fuck R- up. russian production yeah absolutely yeah. they still do it the old way they're like okay we're gonna come and like start blowing shit up and and so i just formal. want to for the people that um you know that just getting to you know you right now mm. i'll just tell uh you played with some of the biggest names uh, in in jazz fusion you Somewhat know something yeah. all right uh, stanley clark right right For a while yeah uh you have you put uh three albums out or two albums two albums, you, yeah. two albums yeah. right yeah and you have stanley clark chick Corea, george duke playing yeah. in on your album that's the first one yeah they just really wanted me to to release something they were so helpful like can you please put a record out like we'll help and <laughs> they all just <laughs> hopped on and played on it because they knew i have to get the first out so that i get the second out so that i get the third but you gotta get that first one out and they were all super super sweet just like supportive okay. yeah well just just god just put something out like back when we were your age we were doing three albums a year i'm like yeah i know i know and it was different and i was so scared i'm like i don't know if i'm ready for this i'm confused what kind of music should i make is this good is this no like just whatever we'll i'll play on it you'll play we'll play on it like just so they all agree it was really really great. All right, so fun. before, so now let's go back. I mm-hmm. just wanted people to know, sure. and also you play with Josh Grabman, right? With Josh Wright for a while, yeah. And uh, who else? Oh, God, that, man, it's been, I've been in LA for 16 years and on the East Coast for a couple. I've played, we, we should probably put a list of names underneath. Just, just I, give me I, two. I've had to pick, <laughs> well, I mean, I've done Alicia Keys stuff. I've, I've done uh, Lauren Hill stuff. I, I've done, uh, I've, paid a lot of rent playing for a lot of people <laughs> okay okay so and did you start playing in the ukraine that's yeah. where okay yeah absolutely and do you think that that uh the russian discipline <laughs> right yeah the, of playing the, 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 did help yeah well you see i started it was it's a funny story i started playing by ear and very quickly uh you know the, the music teachers came to my dad and so that if, unless he sends me you know to study serious music, which is classical music, of course, I'm going to be a, a, a wedding musician or a street musician. And if he doesn't want that to happen, he better send me to study some serious music. And, and so what he did in his wisdom is he did that. He sent me to study classical music. But there was a guy in my town who was like a big rebel who no one, no one wanted to you know, take him seriously. He walked bare, barefoot and wrote songs against the government and listened to Earth, Wind and Fire on like cassettes, copies of copies of copies of cassettes and had a little Yamaha keyboard. He was completely com- an outcast, but he was into George Benson and Earth, Wind and Fire and, and, and you know, a queen and, and he wrote songs against the government and it was the mid, the mid 80s. So you wouldn't go to jail for that. You just wouldn't be cool. Like people yeah. wouldn't mess with you like, yeah. So my dad sent me to study with him too. We just sit and improvise on the floor. I was five or six years old and his wife was a classical pianist. So I would go to their house and study classical with her and then study the other shit. We would just sit and improvise and listen to music and play to records with him. What type of, oh, like, uh, like jet records that came like, from uh, yeah, yeah, in America? Co- copies, yeah, you had to smuggle them in. And like, if someone had it, the people would make copies of copies of copies of cassettes of cassettes of copies of copies. It's like, so, but he had a lot of these. You couldn't just go buy them. But, you know, musicians had them. Like George Benson had a record. So like a year and a half later, you could find some horrible 25th fucking copy of it on the cassette. And he'd have it. Right. Okay. And so we would listen to that stuff on the floor. And he was like, at the time, a young guy. And he was crazy. But he was creative and free. And he was a real free spirit a songwriter. And he wasn't having any other propaganda bullshit. And he certainly wasn't having any of it around music. So my dad knew that, sure, classical is cool. But let me send my son to study with this crazy motherfucker so they could just sit and listen to some American music and improvise because my dad didn't want that to die in me. Okay. Because I started doing, I just started picking things up by ear and improvising and my dad knew that it would be a bad idea if that was just all left to die and I just become a classical pianist. And then uh, Mm -hmm. your parents moved to Israel, right? Israel, yeah, in 1990. Okay, so you were about 10 years old? I was almost 10, yeah. yeah, I was almost 10. And so you spend the next 10 years, right? That's right. right. I spend the next decade here. 
And so what was the influence of, of being in Israel for you? Well, for, you know, it was a, it's a combination of a couple things. I, uh, I was, first of all, older and I could be exposed to more complex music because my brain was getting bigger. That's one. Two, you could go buy it at a store. You know, my dad went and bought me a cassette now. So it's not a copy of a copy of a copy or something. Just go in and just buy a CD or a cassette. It was 92, 93 when I really started getting into um, into jazz. Uh, it was like a school band and they had like a, I don't know, Summertime or Take Five or something. And I took a real liking to that sound and to the, and I got really interested in more interesting complex harmony. And my dad started hearing me play and he was like, oh, I think that's jazz. So he like he started buying me records and like he found me some t-shirts and it was, you know, at least if you want to pursue that, you're much better off in Israel as a kid than you would have been in Soviet Union or even Ukraine of today. You know, it's there's just more information, more access to someone yeah. for someone like me. So then you moved to America yeah. in your early yeah, 20s, right. right? That's right. And I was 19, actually. 19. So, yeah. And so you moved, to, uh, you moved to college, to Boston, yes, to right. Berkeley, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know that you played, you told me once that you played, you know, I know you played with uh, Doobie Powell. I did. Who, who is, uh, uh, you know, a gospel, complete jazzy gospel guy, right? Right. Right. And that we that we really love, and you know, yeah. people who know his music really yeah. love his music. Absolutely. Um, how did it come about? How did you meet him? Oh well. And was it your break? Like that was like oh, one I, of your I, breaks? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, it certainly was. And it, it, looking back at it, it opened a lot of doors for a lot of other work later, because a, a lot of the people who um, do a lot of pop work in the states now. They come from the gospel sort of scene. And when I started working with Doobie a little more, uh, I think when I was moving to LA, I think he told Teddy Campbell about me that I'm coming, and then Teddy put me on a lot of stuff and like introduced me to some. So it all it all helped. But how how did it come about? Oh oh, easy yeah, absolutely easy. Because you're, very, not, you're very, not Christian. No, exactly right. I moved black. to Berkeley to <laughs> yeah. play jazz, and I uh, very quickly you know I I had what probably what you call as like a Wonderkind syndrome. I, I, you know, I really thought I was the absolute best thing that ever happened, and uh, very quickly I, I realized in jazz that it's very much not true, and so I became really depressed and I stopped practicing jazz and I stopped playing and I just went to classes and smoked weed, and uh, after a while of that, I, I met people who were playing this interesting music and I couldn't figure out what it was. It felt like it's classical, but it had jazz chords to it. I'm like, what, what is that? And I'm like, well, it's gospel music. I'm like, oh, interesting. And so I, I kind of started listening to a lot of that kind of stuff because I didn't have the pressure of having to be the best or having everyone look at me under a magnifying glass to see if I'm you know, amazing. Because I'm obviously not amazing. I'm a novice at this. And uh, I'm white, <laughs> so like I don't come from this music. So it gave me the freedom to just really l love music and, and, and figure, you know, and try to sound better playing it. And so before you know it, I was hanging out with a lot of sort of gospel church cats and, 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 and inviting them over and having them play and record them and like f try to figure out what they're doing. And then when you do that, Uh, you sort of get connected to stuff that's um, that's the hip sound right now. Like, of course, if you're in the rock and roll scene, you're gonna come across the hot new rock and roll shit. If you're on the gospel scene, you come across the hot new gospel shit. All right. And the hot new gospel shit was Doobie at the time. Okay. And so I learned all. I've I've studied all the records, and I had no idea what he looks like because I had MP3s. I didn't. And so I, I learned all the songs and I sounded just like him and, and that, that I had that whole sound uh, because that's all I was listening to obsessively for a long time. And then we, I was at some shed, we were playing at some church or something. And I was playing and I, I see like a bunch of dudes sitting over there like looking at me like I'm crazy. And I'm like, wait, okay. And then they walk up and introduce themselves and it's like Doobie and Kevin. And I'm like, hey, uh, And I had no idea it was them. Okay. <laughs> what like, did you play? To, to, oh, I don't remember. Play. I don't remember. It was. It's not even so much what I played. It's just at the time when 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 we were 
whatever I'd play, I'd have that sound, I'd have their stuff. So can you show me like what is that vibe or that oh, sound? Oh, I, I would, I, I feel really, I'll, I'll play, I'll play you like a little intro of what I was shedding back then. I can't really summarize that. No, it doesn't have it's to hard. do back then, but I want to understand. Like, yeah, I, okay. I probably, well, they, they have all the gospel traditional sort of stuff, but they have a lot of other, like, like the like the parallel chord stuff like the I probably play some stuff like that yeah, I probably play that Like it's it's gospel, but like, and I'm not a big expert on it. It's just I probably knew more of their music than I knew proper, you know, gospel music. The, so what the, is? But what they is, heard it. They heard it, and they were like, "Hey, we're playing a gig tomorrow. You want to play? You obviously know the, the shit." And I was like, yeah, "Absolutely." I just I didn't know it were that was them. Probably a good thing. I would have been more nervous to play had I had I known. And it was cool. So I didn't, what was the experience to play with them? A, oh, a, a versus like as you know the other jazz. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. it's a, it's a different thing. Absolutely, and it's it's as complex. It's I yeah, think yeah, it's yeah. more complex. It's so. uh, for sure. Yeah, it's it's got its own world of complexity harmonically and rhythmically. And yeah, it's I don't even know, man. I was, I couldn't believe it. I just I couldn't. It was it, it was that thing that you kind of go and you practice 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 i didn't practice all that stuff in hopes to play with them i just practiced because i wanted to sound like that and then it all came kind of came together and yeah i was really proud i was very happy i was super nervous uh should i still be nervous now if i if i played with them <laughs> because you really are stepping into a world right you're stepping into a thing that they have and in general if you if you play gospel music or whatever i'm i'm not a gospel player in, in any way i don't consider myself one I, i'm someone who plays and got the chance to play a bunch of it uh under some serious people who really play that music well like sometimes it's all they play and sometimes they play, they come from that and they play other things but i was really lucky to to sit under a bunch of cats that are like that and among which you know, as DP and, the, you know, the family, the Billy and, and, and everybody. And, okay, and so. the, the Powell family. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, that's a sound, and it goes back before Doobie, Ivan Powell, like, that's that's a thing, they, they, you know. Uh, but the, the, most of the shows would happen in churches? Well, we did some stuff in churches. We, we went to a couple of conventions, like, like, like uh, Christian conventions performed there. Uh, we did a live recording, I think. A live regard, and I played on some other stuff uh, over the years, uh, some of it remotely. But um, yeah, it would be. I wouldn't even care, I and mean, we would drive to some state. Some let's let's do some some uh, some of that thing. Oh right? sure, yeah, let's do it. Uh, show me a little bit of those changes. Oh yeah, of, like, oh yeah. Cycle, and we'll oh, just yeah, go for right, it. All right, right. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so so really that's a Doobie Powell thing, right? Yeah, I think so. Well, right. we'll, we'll see. We'll send it to him later and see if he recognizes <laughs> it. <laughs>
DP. Man, that, 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 this stuff would be like all I played uh, for a long time, for like two and a half years. Uh, like if you caught me in my like what, my mid to late twenties, how did it help all. you in your overall playing? Well, playing you know gospel? what, right? You know what? I, I never became a gospel player, but what I learned was because a lot of times I would meet people, right? piano players or bass players or whatever musicians who knew less stuff than I did because I came from jazz and I came from classical and I came from a bunch of like new harmony and I'd meet a lot of people who knew less stuff than I know but they had a ability to find the spots of when they would find what they call it placement. They would, play, they would take the fewer things or the, sometimes the few things they know and they'd find the perfect spot to, to, to put something. To, and I'm like, wow, what an amazing instinct to have. And where do you not need that? That's exactly what I've always felt like I, I lacked in my jazz playing. It's, 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 that, it's that ability to really have time things like I really think, well. I think yeah, that in jazz, a lot of times when somebody plays uh, a melody mm -hmm. and uh, some the, the people that play the harmony or whatever, they don't necessarily mean to make the melody sound nicer hmm. or richer. Mm. It's just more interesting. Right. And in gospel, mm. it sounds somehow nicer right well a lot of because ultimately right i know what you mean i think the great jazz players they do that too the it's just always the greats right. are doing, but, but right yeah. but, but but in gospel that's the actual game yeah that's yeah. exactly that there is no other game to play that as the game because it's song-based music at the end of the day yeah we see them shred and we see them now like gospel chops and all the cool stuff but ultimately this is a music that comes from someone singing and someone playing behind them so there's obviously going to be a lot of mileage in that tradition of people figuring out how to play behind singers because, you know, this whole new gospel chops thing is very, very, very new. Up until very recently, there really wasn't a whole lot of that. But there, what there was a whole lot of is what you're talking about, is playing behind a singer and make the singer, and make the melody sound, sound good and make, you know, either whether you're singing, whether you're comping, it's it's also a music that's in service of, right? Gospel yeah. is a music that's in principle, it's an in service of something. All music should be that way and is. Absolutely. But in gospel, again, there is really no way out of that, right? You're in church and if you get too busy, you get too out of, out of pocket, you get yelled at because you're interrupting the process. So you literally can't, you have to focus on what matters just as a matter of what you're doing. That there is no, you know, if you play too many notes, you're interrupting the, the flow of the service. People will look at you funny. So you learn not to do that early on. So and you learn how to make the melody sound nicer early on because that's what you're there to do. If you're 17 and you're playing at a church or whatever. That's the gig. That's what you do. So that no wonder they later end up on a bunch of pop gigs and because they have those abilities. And, and nowadays also the, the most... The, the the jazz that's going on right now right. that's coming out right now is very influenced by all of that stuff yeah yeah yeah, yeah of course yeah that's, you know that's and happening. I think it's it makes it even more accessible now sure um, yeah why who are you like now you're like uh, you know people that you listen to nowadays that you think are that the you know not not that not necessarily have to be gospel but no even sure in jazz, but you know, it's, it's, it's funny. It's a funny thing. I, I'm reaching that age where it's really tricky for me sort of to see these things because I'm maybe too close to them. And a lot of these people are, are my, my friends and people who I've known for, for a while before they blew up. Or 
But now from LA, right? From LA, from New York, yeah, <coughs> from from yeah. Because there is a, a a big a big scene there, a right? big scene that's in right. LA that's that right. is like the, the yeah. now jazz. That's thing, right, like Kamasi Washington. That's right, that's right. That's yeah, uh, Kamasi uh, Thundercat, Thundercat, those guys. Yeah, yes. absolutely, absolutely. They're they're definitely they're definitely leading the way of some. At some, it, I think it it'll take some time to historically to see what what it actually is but there re really is a movement uh, that's happening that's coming and out of LA it, it, what is do you have did you figure out why like because I know they all come from the same oh, yeah. high school or art school I think, or whatever I, I think my, my best bet would be uh, that to me they are kids who had jazz in school and hip hop at home like when i when okay. i play with them when i when i hang with them when I, when i when i when i see them to me they are those they are i've always my analysis of, of those people has always been that you know there was jazz in in, in school or something like band but at, at home they would listen to records that either their parents listened to which is a lot of soul and R&B or the the records of the time which was you know Dr. Dre whatever whatever they were listening to yeah. Snoop or whatever they were listening to and I think the same similarly to what happened to me I think and to any artist when they became older these things started sort of to merge more uh, there was some jazz in it there was some hip hop in it there was some complexity in it there was some attitude to it it was All of those things, and 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 I think it's the, it, that, it reflects the now. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and and that's kind of how it works. I think people yeah. people emerge and and they 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 really absorb certain things, and then they manifest that new thing, that sound. How did you get to play with Stanley Clark? Because I think that was your big break, right? Right, like, right. That was the. How the, did it come about? Oh, someone recommended me. A, a friend of mine used to play on his band, and he told me that that Stanley's looking for um, for keyboard players or whatever, and um, I, I sent him a tape. I mailed him a tape, with a letter, and I played this kind of music and that some, some funk, some fusion stuff, some some jazz stuff. Mm -hmm. So that you know, and I sent him, and I, and I haven't heard back for like seven months. I'm like, oh fuck, I you know, I blew it. Like, seven months. Oh yeah, yeah. All right. I, I, you know, I, I, I little did I know that you know, it's just you know, it, it, he had probably shit some movie to score or whatever the fuck. So I didn't realize that his life was managed like a year in advance, and all of these people, not just him, people who are, you know, bigger sort of big solo artists. That it's not like okay, I'm gonna attend. This is gonna, I'm gonna attend to this a month from now. This is this is urgent, and we got to do this. And then at some point, he called me. It was like six or seven months uh, after I sent the tape, and he left me a voicemail. I'm like, oh man, this is great. So I flew, I flew out there. I flew out there, and um, we played, and uh, we, we hung out, and we talked, and that was it. We just started doing gigs, and you know, it, it, it was it was a great time in my life, and and and, and he really trusted me after a while, and really let me do a lot of stuff for the project like be it on records or or or, or live it's in that sense it was a really old school kind of gig like you know like you, the elder, you, you, the yeah like like yeah, i called you do what you were doing you yeah know, i would call someone else if i don't like it and if i won't i, I might call someone else but you do what you're doing and like that's it that's, that's and a you very played, old school you you're a piano player right mm -hmm. and then hiromi uh, was oh, right. in there the was, band, right? For well, there was that one CD. There was that one okay. project that we did because I think they are they were on the same label with Hiromi, and so I think it was some it was someone's idea that they do a record together. Okay, that's what it was. And and uh, and they did, and it was cool. And so me and Hiromi go way back. We used to go to school together to Berkeley. So I know Hiromi from Boston. Okay. Uh, so then she flew out, and we, I remember we were, we recorded for a couple of days, and then I think she left, and we ended up doing a bunch of posts and, and overdubs and stuff, and then we did a tour <coughs> with that band where I played Rhodes and she played piano, and then there was bass and uh, drums, and yeah, we we did a whole year of festivals and like 
crazy, crazy stuff. Yeah, because he got finally you got a Grammy out of that's it. That's right? right. That's right. That's right. That that record that record did really well. Uh, yeah, man. It was oh man, this is all like a while ago at this point. But yeah, we we um, I I don't know what it took and, and and how it came came about. There's a lot that goes. Into but did, but like did this. you go to the Grammy? Yeah, well, thing? Stanley was actually out of town. He was actually gone. He was not. So we went. It was me, Ronald, the drummer, and Stanley's wife, Sophia. The three of us went. Okay. To the ceremony. And Stanley was, I think he was out with Chick, with Chick Corea somewhere, playing some, in some country. And okay, well, you know, work is work. You know, it's, a, it's a trophy, is nice, but he had to, they had, they had some gig or something. And so, yeah, we went and uh, it was crazy that we were nominated and said, so it was like, okay, cool. But like, I, I you know, I wasn't, Tuxedo and all? Yeah, you have to. Man. I don't know what you're in, but you got to show up right. I still have it. I don't think I've worn it ever since. I still it's still in my closet. So I wrote like three sentences just in case we're gonna win, which we probably won't. But then we did, and so you know you you see that whole little thing of me going up there and like saying my little piece and. Ronald giving his big piece and holding a thing, and then Sophia said a couple, a sentence or two. And yeah, it was really, really crazy. I, I, uh, I, um, when we won, like the, the following year, I, I've, I've never had less work. Really? But, yeah, than I've ever had than the next, the following year, because a, a lot of, with well, Stanley still worked. But so, so that was that. But it was, I, it was never, I was never just, I, it was usually him or I had another gig or I do multiple things. It sort of became like I might be like too expensive now, you know? And so people stopped calling. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's a funny. I know, I know, I know that. It's I a know that funny thing, thing when it happens. Yeah. And yeah. you don't really, it's one of the, I, I really think that it, like we're all just looking through a keyhole into what things are until they happen to us and then you really open the door and you see what it's actually like. I'm sure that had I been a solo artist at the time with a solo career, this would have put more fuel into my fire winning a Grammy. Yeah. And because I wasn't, it kind of just made everyone think I might be more expensive now. And I was, I was a sideman for, for, for a living, for jazz or pop. So man, I was like, Damn, hey. I need some fucking money. <laughs> Can I sell this shit? <laughs> but it was a huge honor and it was really cool because, you know, music wise, like Stanley let me do a bunch of stuff on that record. Like my, my composition is the first song on this on that CD. Okay. Yeah, and, and a bunch of other stuff. So musically, it was super, super awesome. And, you know, we, we worked a lot on on this project and and again by that point stanley kind of trusted me and, and let me do uh Your thing. A, a lot of yeah. you know here i need this arranged and if i couldn't you know he's like well if here you do it and if you know if it sucks i'll do it and then i do it and it was usually fine and 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 so it ended up and and he was very generous with you know production credit and publishing and all that stuff he would always split stuff like uh, very fairly and would give us writing credit and like all that stuff so that was that was really really cool and then, then you know the trophy the thing is it's man it's it's like it's a it's a nice job if you can get it but it, it, it it's I don't ever see it as a representative of, of, of how it, it, it didn't change your life overnight well yeah it made me less <laughs> money overnight but if, in any other way well I mean no it has a ring to it that I'm a Grammy award winning this that or the other yeah in, in that exactly. regard it, it did change my life because like it doesn't like you could find someone in the Sahara Desert and tell them I'm a Grammy award winning something and they'll be like oh really and all of a sudden my cachet sort of goes up a little so it changed my life I got that little prefix before my name which is cool to have it's just put it on your on a shirt you know like that's right Grammy, that's right I'm polishing Grammy, my Grammy yeah. well you know what it's funny I think I've done worse shit than this I, we had a crowdfunding thing for my CD a couple of years ago. And we printed a bunch of T-shirts with my with my face on them, and so we made the money. This is sort of an apropos. We made the money. I made the CD. It was great, but we had some T-shirts left over from you know from the fundraiser, and so I I still sleep 
in some of the, I just like, I'll, 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 I won't go out wearing it, but like, I'll go to bed in a t-shirt with my own fucking face on it. <laughs> and I remember one time going to a Whole Foods. I, I just woke up. I was like, oh, well, I got to get something to eat. I got my keys. I went in the car and I'm paying at the Whole Foods and I'm buying my own food. And like, and so I'm like, oh, whatever. I'm looking around and the, the cashier lady is looking at me like, crazy motherfucker wearing his own fucking face on his t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like oh my god and i i just like woke up i i, I don't go out wearing this stuff but i'm like wow the the, the things she must think like oh my <laughs> what a peak of narcissism but yeah like you're right like make another t-shirt like yeah i'm a grammy winner right Right, so I get even less work. Is that is that <laughs> is that the goal? <laughs> yeah, if you when you want to quit. Right, uh, that's right. That's how you make it quit. Like I'm expensive. Prices just went up. Rosalind, when um, Doobie Powell came to mm -hmm. uh, the Red Sea Jazz Festival, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for that. Oh, actually, you, you know man, because you, you I'm made so the connection. I'm so happy. That and I was like, yo, I gotta, you know. I'm so happy. That I gotta happened. bring him. God, I'm <laughs> so glad you you get you get it. And now that you have the keys to the kingdom, you decided to do something like this. Um, I had the opportunity. That's, that's all. Amazing. You know. Amazing. And I'm and, so uh, happy it happened, man. Wow. So when he came and he played, he played one of your tunes. Yeah, right, right. And he right. changed the lyrics that's also. Right, that course, it, yeah. it became like a gospel. That's right. Yeah. Jewish Christian. Right. That's right. That's right. Thing. It was it was amazing because um, <laughs> right. I, I will tell the people um, that okay, it's a jazz festival in the desert, and it's very hot in the desert and um, on the Red Sea. And it hardly ever rains there. On that day, that wow. was the only day that it rained wow. from morning up until five minutes before he put his foot on stage. Jeez. And then it stopped raining while he was wow. you know, performing. And once he stopped performing, the rain it came rain back. came back, you know. So go figure. Um, man. He, you have a, a song called a uh, tune called Bees Knees. That's right, and, and he, he I think he really liked that outro part part of it, and he, yeah, and he used it and he made a song out of it. He made a song called That's Yahweh. So cool, <laughs> Yahweh, and the whole crowd was singing Yahweh. Amazing. <laughs> it makes sense to them too. A bunch of Jews, like they get yeah. what he, he's talking about. Hey, written by a Jew. That's right. Let's let's, let's let's do it. You know. Yeah, you know. and it's funny he, the way he flipped it was completely not how it's recorded, but he just he has a thing. He will take. A musical piece and he'll make it his own like in an instance could you, know? could you show me I'll, I'll give you in a minute the beat but show me at first how you wrote it yeah I mean I'll play it to you when we're done. It was like that. And then he went and like, you know, I like these chords. And he put a B on it. And I'm like, Let's woo! Like that, right? Fire. Yeah, that's 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 more like that's more <laughs> kind of how he did it. All right. Uh um on A. Uh, a
Yeah, but that's so. a beautiful tune, man. Thanks, man. <laughs> it's it's so it's it the ending. tune. The tune is called Bees Knees. Yes, and there's a bunch of stuff going on. A, a, a really cool sign of a song when you write. I'm sure you know this as well. As this was a vamp ending vamp of a song, and a, a really good sign is when you write something and you just want to sort of keep playing it. Around and yeah. around, and it kind of feels. Oh, I could kind of keep playing this. And it, when I, when this came up, I was like, man, this is a good sign. I kind of I dig this, and I kind of want to keep playing it. And it's always. And this was one of those tunes for me. And then you know, Doobie grabbed it and and put his own thick sauce on it, and was like, yeah, and wrote some lyrics. And like, oh, I never in a million years envisioned it like this. So, on which album of yours? Is oh, it? this is a lifetime away. This is my last. My my, the 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 last album I did was Who just two years ago. Who plays on that album? On that one, there was well, okay. So Gary Novak played drums. John Petitucci played bass. Bob Menser was on on saxophone. Uh, a bunch of other people. Uh, Mike Miller played guitar. Ugh, oh, a, a bunch of folks. It was you know I I, I kind of called and you recorded it in Stanley LA? played yeah Stanley played, Stanley played on the song yeah he did we recorded yeah I recorded it in, in Los Angeles it's a good thing to be in LA because you have a bunch of friends and they have studios and musicians you could kind of make things happen relatively easily because people are there and uh, John flew I think John Petrucci flew out for some some project and he was in town I think for the Monk Institute so I just grabbed him and, and just brought, brought him to the studio and he killed it, you know, and then Gary Novak. And th those guys are my heroes. I kind of had to get that out of my system, too. Like, I made, you know, this upcoming album I have now is in, pretty much entirely made with my peers. You know? Okay. It's probably the first one that, that, that the previous one, the Mincer was on it, like all these guys. And, and uh, yeah, it was it was a thrill. George Duke. Duke was on the previous. Duke was yeah. on my first record. So yeah. I, oh, I want to yeah. talk about th that for a second because I yeah, mean Stanley yeah. Clark, Chick Corea, and George Duke. That's right. Uh, the reason I started playing bass is really mm. I went, I went. Um, my mom took me to see Jeff Beck. Right. In like '79. That's right. And I didn't even know who Jeff Beck was. Mm -hmm. I just knew he was a guitar player. Mm -hmm. But then in the middle of the show, she goes. Uh, there was the, the bass player took a solo and she goes this is the best bass player in the world his name yeah. is Stanley Clark and I was Amazing. like oh my god you know Amazing. he looked funky as well yeah, you know, he had a big afro and the whole thing absolutely and so I started that's the first time I, I the next day I bought his album he had like the yeah. best the best of yeah, Stanley absolutely. Clark and that's how I got into f bass actually and and for the possibilities of bass, I'm so grateful right. that he was the, the my first mm. influence. That did not I did not go from the bottom That's <laughs> to right. the top. Right, right, I started right, right. from Stanley Clark, right? Sure. And then I figured out the way. That's right. Yeah, that's uh, kind of what happened to me a lot with with my musical heroes yeah. as well. I started somewhere and then I went back. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so, uh, so he, for me, is a huge influence because it opened my ears to, That's right. to jazz, actually. That's right. Because on these albums, all of a sudden, it'd be like Upright and right. Chick Corea. That's right. That's right. And, and all of those things. So here is my uh, thing. You, you have to, to play with Chick Corea or George Duke. What was that experience? Uh, you know, because it's your own thing. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And... I, I, Look, man, I, 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 looking back now, I really think that what it really was is for me, I was just trying to survive psychologically the fact that it's even happening, you know, for me. And I was, I was younger. Now I'm kind of a little calmer, a little older. I've done those things. Up until having done those things, I haven't done those things, right? It was, okay. it was the, so it was really, I remember particularly with, with 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 Chick with George, also like we we just had to do a, a couple takes before I kind of <sighs> okay I think I think we're finding a groove here we're finding a thing we're finding a, a gel and it's a weird experience because you have this with your friends then you okay we're locking into something and but and then you have your heroes right but having that with your heroes it's almost like you're not. I'm not so, used to that experience. And so, then we just played a, a little more and a little more and things kind of clicked together. 
That, that was while the recording session the, the, on that date. Mm -hmm. That was just one date. One oh, no, well, they were separate. Yeah, I went to George's house and, and Hollywood, okay. and I went to Chick's house in, in uh, Florida to do that at his house. And I spent the whole day there, and he, has two be he had two beautiful pianos. I think one of them was sold now. And uh, he had a beautiful Bosendorfer and a beautiful Yamaha in there. And he had an engineer, and they hosted me, and we ate and talked and, and, and hung out and recorded. And yeah, I'll never forget this day, you know, to the, to the day I die. It was, of course. It was absolutely <laughs> nuts to go to his house to do this thing. And it was like, God, oh, wow. What was the tune? Can you play a little bit of yeah, that tune? Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was something I wrote when I was 16 years old. Okay. Because, and and I, you know, when, when he agreed to play, it was something I, I wrote that was also kind of you know, a 16 year old mind. And I was listening to him a lot too. So it okay. was kind oh, so of maybe so a little bit like him. Sort of, uh, what was it? It was, it was, uh, it section and all and, and so you wrote that at 16 yeah yeah and That's then nice. and thanks man that was, that was fun and i figured i figured instead of trying to reinvent whatever i figured this could be a cool tune we could do and and it'll be right up his alley he will murder and he did it'll be fun and i sent him the chart and george duke what did you do with george duke oh well george you see that there's a big there's an interesting george uh doobie connection too okay because uh uh because George is probably Doobie's like biggest hero. Yeah. And so and I knew that and I and I wrote a tune for George for me and George to play for our home remember. I don't remember how it goes. a lot of Doobie's stuff in it too and I named it Hubert which is Doobie's first name and Doobie's uh, dad's name and I named it Hubert for that fan for Doobie yeah. and his pops and, and and me and George recorded it and I sent it to Doobie and I was like here your, your favorite guy and I wrote the song and I probably stole a bunch of Doobie's shit out <laughs> they like a bunch of little passages that if you know Doobie's music you could hey that might be so, like something like that so I kind of wrote a song like that to connect that whole thing because Doobie's really like he really loves George Duke's music a lot, and George, you know, was an influence on all of us. And if I have the opportunity, I write something kind of soulful and 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 that let's see, you know, how George and I might pull this off. And George played Rhodes, and I played a piano, and we did it at his house. And man, it was it was crazy. There's still pictures from this stuff from some yeah. You also sing. I don't. I no, don't. You, you're a really good singer. You I, just don't. I know. No, you're not, oh you, boy. You, you're oh not on that level of your piano playing. And this was, deal. in my defense, this was all Stanley's fault. No, <laughs> so was he was ADA. right. You're like, you should sing. And he was like, I sing. We all sing. Like, it's fine. Don't, and he was exactly like, you just don't worry about it. Just go. And so we recorded me singing. It's true. It's all. It's all on, on those records. You sing really, really good. Oh, wow. Your rendition of, uh, of Sting. Oh, that's not me, dude. That's not you singing? Are you kidding me? If that was me, I would be on a gig right now. Oh, I'm the, I'm, I sang I'm, the other ones. No, are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, my God. If I sang like that good. I oh, was like, no. Dad, no. He sings so well, me? man. Like, he sings no, that Sting song. I no, was like, that's, Damn, Trevor, you know? that's my friend Trevor Wesley, who is amazing. Yeah, I know, I know the track. I sing on other tracks on that CD, but it's no, I would never. That's the one song I would not dare to do. I called my friend Trevor, who's who's a really tremendous singer. I think Stanley used him on some records also, and I and I was like, hey, hey man, could you maybe sing this song? And 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 we thought for a long time who we could call. 
Because I sang some other stuff and we did it and, and, and Stanley's but like, hey, don't worry still, about it. Still, I'm telling you. Right. Do, do, you can do more of that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd have to really hate you to sing for you and like to really ruin your day. Uh, it's I, you it's know a what? whole other beast. No, man. I don't think so. But I, I started singing just about two years ago. Oh, no way. And the first few shows, you know, I was like, oh, oh, shit, you know, and, you know, like really more yeah. like singing, you know, leading the song. Yeah. And, uh, and, but it's really like anything else. It's a yeah, muscle. you just get better at it. And you yeah. get better. And after a while, you really don't think yeah. about it. And yeah, I, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. so happy. Sure. I'm almost, I'm almost not thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Well, thinking good, about it. good, but, uh, yeah. I mean, sure, that means I still have some time. Yeah, I, yeah but, but I'll, I'll I'll what get, I'm saying I'll get there once I figure more. this out. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> listen, Roslyn, I hope to see you next year at the Red Sea Jazz. Absolutely, man. Absolutely, you know? yeah. And uh, so, so I though. know that it's going to be uh, oh, off the chain. I can't wait. Every time, I mean, this is, you know, aside from me being biased, and this is really is one of the best festivals. Like, and it's not, I'm not just saying it because... I'm from here, and like I've played on a you know on every festival under the sun at this point, and this really is that's such an event, and it always has been. It's like the history of this of, of the festival, and I'm so happy to know that you are now sort of at the helm, you know, the creative directing and stuff. Thank so you. So we have a lot of good things to to expect and see. Doobie would would have you know it really took someone like you to sort of make that call. And you know, we got Doobie to come here to the to the whole yeah, event he, and he play was, some music. He was, it was an amazing experience because it was it was bigger than just the music. It was That's wider. Right. You know, I don't know what it was, but That's right. but the, That's right. as I told him, I was like, Jesus was here. Then, then, oh, then, I'm <laughs> sure he would agree. I'm sure he would agree. <laughs> the rest of the country, the, the, it was That's the right. opposite. The rest of the country was like a heat wave, fires everywhere. That's right. And only in the desert where he plays in that eight miles was radius rain, was like raining. And it stopped and for his show. Yeah, and it then, was just that's right. amazing. Yeah, yeah, right. So um, before uh, we go, you know, um, let's just play one of my things. Let's do it. And that is, let me just set let it up go. with the, start playing something in A while I'm setting up the tempo, all right?
Thank you yeah. so much, man. <laughs> My man. Had a good time. It's always a funky old time. And we'll see you um, next time. Shavu Abba. Litaot. See you. Peace. Salam alaikum. <laughs> <laughs>